Hello everyone and welcome to the Workplace Safety North webinar, Worker Contact with Motor Vehicles, Top Health and Safety Risk for Mining Operations. My name is Paige Splain and I'm the Event Specialist here at WSN. Before we get started, we want to mention a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, you may see your screen freeze up or hear static on the microphone. This is usually temporary and due to internet connection issues. We appreciate your patience and understanding with the technology. Your microphones have been muted and we ask that you use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen for speaker questions. If you have any technical issues using the Zoom application, do let us know in the chat box and we'll do our best to help you. So to clarify, please put any commentary or technical questions into the chat box and speaker questions into the Q&A section. A link to the webinar recording, a copy of the presentation, and resource of information will be sent to you within one business day. Today, we are joined by Bob Barkley from the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development, as well as Philip Dirige and Sam Barbudo from Workplace Safety North. Now I'll pass it over to you, Philip. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the short introduction, uh, Pace. Yeah, um, before we start the presentation, I would like to uh, 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 for you to look at uh, a poll that will be showing up uh, shortly, uh, or probably on your screen. It's a, we call it a beginning poll, and the question would be, what would be the most effective health and safety support for industry? Uh, choose all that applies in your personal opinion. Um, as I as mentioned by uh, Paige, there will be uh, three co-hosts for this uh, presentation or webinar. Uh, Barb Barkley will be uh, providing the presentation for the uh, Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development portion. And then I will jump in and talk a, a little bit of uh, the uh, in information about why we're doing this and a little bit of introduction, uh, uh, a short brief introduction of uh, root cause analysis processes, uh, some solutions and controls, and then um, some Barbudo will be talking about um, WSN information and resources that you could use in preparing your program. And then we'll end it up with uh, uh, Q&A, as mentioned by Paige, uh, you can uh, ask questions through the uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen at the end of the uh, presentation. Next slide, please. So this is the agenda for today. Bob will start uh, presenting the root cause analysis that was conducted back in 2018 on mobile equipment. And I don't want to steal his thunder with regards to what would that be, and he will be uh, presenting those ones. I mentioned earlier about the background introduction, which I will be providing a little bit of information. Why is it so important to do root cause analysis, not just doing a root cause analysis process when there was an incident, uh, but a proactive way of doing it to dig deeper on to be able to develop better controls in order for an incident not to happen uh, in the future. And then uh, we'll provide uh, uh, a little bit of solutions and controls. And some of these could be uh, legislative uh, 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 compliant, and some of these are based on uh, best practices. And then uh, Sam Barbuda, as I mentioned earlier, will provide you some of the information as far as uh, the website is concerned and resources that could uh, uh, that you could use in preparing your uh, your program. And then we'll end it up with uh, uh, Q and A. Without uh, further ado, I will give you Bob Barkley to provide the uh, MLTSD presentation. Thanks very much, Philip. And um, I want to first of all thank WSN for um, organizing this uh, this webinar. I think it's a really good opportunity for us to uh, publicize the um, the findings from the root, the mobile equipment root cause analysis that we that we conducted uh, in uh, 2018. So the portion of the presentation that, um, that I'll be delivering uh, will cover the elements that are listed here on this slide. First of all, we'll talk a little bit about the risk assessment project. We'll talk uh, about the, the subject um, that we pursued in this uh, root cause analysis, namely uh, mobile equipment, looking at hazards associated with that. 
talk, we'll provide a little bit of background information, revisiting the risk assessment that was done in 2014 as part of a, a formal review of mining health and safety for underground mining in Ontario. This was led by the ministry in throughout 2014 and the early part of 2015. We'll talk uh, primarily about the root cause analysis that was conducted. We'll talk about the risk statement or the unwanted event that we selected uh, to explore as part of this root cause analysis. Then we'll delve a little bit into um, the workshop participants, how the risk assessment team was selected and who some of the other participants uh, were that took part in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the session. Spend quite a bit of time talking about the fishbone diagram. This was one of the key products from the root cause analysis. And what it's intended to do is to capture those uh, causal factors, which are thought to be uh, uh, contributing factors to the, to the unwanted event in question. Then we'll move on into uh, what the corresponding co uh, causal factors were that were identified by the risk assessment team for, uh, for the, only for the 10 primary causal factors. Uh, then finally, what I'll do is um, I'll work through some appendices uh, that are part of this presentation. Specifically, what I'll do is uh, go through some supplemental diagrams uh, for the fishbone uh, diagram that we, we talked about earlier in the presentation. And these describe not only the primary causal factors for the unwanted event in question, but also describe some of the uh, secondary, tertiary, and in some cases, quaternary causal factors that were identified by the team. Um, it would be it was it was be too busy to include those all in one on one diagram. So therefore, we've uh, we've prepared this appendices that uh, that enable us to show uh, in better form what the full product from the root cause analysis session was. And then finally, there's an appendix showing some of the uh, risk assessment methods uh, that are common. Uh, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this diagram describes what is known as a Swiss cheese model. So many of you are probably familiar with, uh, with the concept of the Swiss cheese model. What it does is it speaks to the importance of controls. So I think it's very relevant to, uh, to the conversation that we're having today because two of the key products from a root cause analysis are first of all, the, the causal factors that contribute to the occurrence of, of an unwanted event that's being explored. But then most importantly, what are the corresponding controls um, that we can put in place uh, to, uh, to mitigate that risk? So the, the, the controls are, are a big part of any uh, root cause analysis that is done. So essentially what this diagram shows is a series of uh, slices of Swiss cheese, if you will, five slices of, of Swiss cheese as you can see in the diagram. And what these are intended to represent are controls that could be put in place to prevent the unwanted event that's shown in the upper right-hand corner of the diagram. Um, so the way that the concept works is that th there are holes in each slice of Swiss cheese, right? And these are intended to represent potential weaknesses in, in each of the controls in question. So the idea behind this, this model or this diagram is that if, if, if in some cases, if the holes actually line up, then it's possible that the unwanted event could, incur, could occur in spite of the fact that there, there are controls that have been put in place to, to try and prevent it. So what I think this diagram uh, tries to emphasize is the importance of having robust and a well-maintained controls for, especially for high-risk hazards that we have in the workplace. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, um, there was a formal review of mining health and safety that was led by the Ministry of Labor, then the Ministry of Labor, now the, now the Ministry of Labor Training and Skills Development. And this was conducted throughout uh, 2014 and in the early part of 2015. It was led by the Prevention Office of, of our ministry. It was known as the Mining Health Safety and Prevention Review. So it's important to note that a risk assessment was done as, as part of this review. It wasn't part of the original concept, but it turned out to be a foundational component of the review. So what this risk assessment involved was that over 260 hazards that are common in underground mining uh, were risk ranked. Uh, so, so it's important to note that this review only focused on, uh, on underground mining, not other aspects of mining. Um, so the way this was conducted was that an eight person uh, risk assessment team was established 
It was established to port according to a bipartite model. So we had eight subject matter experts, um, people who were thought to be experts in health and safety uh, from the sector. So we had four of these members who represented labor stakeholders and four who represented employer uh, stakeholders. So uh, throughout the course of the day, when this risk assessment session was conducted in June of, of 2014, the team systematically worked through these 263 hazards that were identified, um, and, and then they voted according to two parameters. So they voted on a one to five scale for uh, on a likelihood uh, of, of the occurrence of any one of these um, unwanted events or hazards. And then again, secondly, they voted on, on the consequence. So if you look at the, the table that's shown in this diagram, it has uh, about six columns, and I'll just briefly take you through um, uh, the, the table. So if you look at the middle column, it has the situation or condition or factor that could result in an illness or an injury. So in other words, what would keep you up at night? So, um, so this describes, this column describes the hazards or unwanted events that were, were actually risk ranked as part of the, uh, as part of the exercise. The column uh, entitled L, so this, what this shows is the average score from the eight voting participants for the likelihood parameter. Similarly, the, the column entitled C shows the average score for the, um, for the consequence parameter that was voted upon by, uh, by the 18 members. So then what you had essentially um, in the final column, the risk column is the, is the risk, which was determined through the product of the likelihood and the consequence. Um, so, uh, the product of this of this exercise that was conducted in 2014 essentially was a ranking from top to bottom of these 263 hazards that were considered according to their level of risk. So what this this slide shows, this table shows, are the top 10 of those 263. So I think uh, what's noteworthy here is you can see there are a number of key hazard themes that dominate the top 10, specifically ground control and mobile equipment are two that uh, two of the key ones that uh, that show up in the top 10. Next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned, there were 263 hazards that were um, that were risk ranked. Uh, so what's important to note is prior to the risk ranking exercise, um, uh, these these 263 hazards were grouped into 25 different categories. So what this the table in this slide shows is the top 10 uh, categories for those 263 hazards. So it's just another way of looking at the data. So I think what's notable here is that again, you see ground control as mo and mobile equipment as, as showing up as the, as the top two categories. Next slide, please. So we mentioned the, uh, the mining review earlier. Um, so the mining review, after, it was, after the final report was published in, in 2015, uh, rendered 18 recommendations. Uh, and they're, they're, they're in the report. I think the, uh, the mining review report is still on the ministry website. All of these 18 recommendations were accepted by the then uh, Minister of Labor, Kevin Flynn. And one recommendation in particular, recommendation 1.1, 1 .1 this is one of the 18 that, uh, that uh, were, were derived from the, uh, from the review. Uh, stated that every three years, the Ministry of Labor should conduct a sector level risk assessment uh, for the mining sector in Ontario. So the first risk assessment was conducted in 2014 as part of, as part of the mining review. So then when two, three years later in 2017, uh, when 2017 rolled around, we had to make a decision as to um, what the next iteration of risk assessment should look like. What should it focus on? So after considerable deliberation and based primarily on the advice of our, uh, of our corporate risk officer, Dr. Sujoy Day, what we decided to do was rather than risk rank a number of hazards again, uh, Dr. Day thought it would be more prudent to actually do a series of root cause analysis instead. So that's what we elected to do moving forward. So the next series of, of sector level risk assessments focused on three themes. The first one conducted in 2017, focused on hazards related to ground control. The second one, the one that we're talking about today that was conducted in, in 2018, focused on, on mobile equipment hazards. And the third one conducted in 2019, focused on water management uh, hazards. 
So the way in which we came up with these three themes were based on the findings from the 2014 uh, risk assessment um, uh, that was uh, conducted as part of the mining review. So essentially, we derived from that the find from those findings what were thought to be some of the highest risk hazard themes, and so we elected to uh, conduct root cause analysis around centered around those 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 three different themes. Um, so what we what we did in each case. Uh, for each of these three, three root cause analysis uh, sessions, again, we established a risk assessment team, uh, again, according to a bipartite model, consisting of a team of, of, uh, of subject matter experts. And the first order of business of the team in each case was to come up with a specific unwanted event that would be the essence of the root cause analysis. So for in the case of the mobile equipment root cause analysis, what the team elected to choose as a, as a risk statement or an unwanted event is shown at the bottom of this slide. It says motor vehicle contacts workers. And so, as I said before, uh, each root cause analysis rendered two key products. The first one are the, are the uh, contributing factors or causal factors that could contribute to the occurrence of, the, of this unwanted event. And secondly, the, cor the controls that correspond to those causal factors. Next slide, please. Um, so again, the, uh, as I said before, the root cause analysis team for the mobile equipment risk assessment was um, established according to a bipartite model. The, sub, the, the, members, the team members were regarded as subject matter experts uh, by their peers, and the members were selected by the stakeholders. It's important to note the ministry did not choose the team members. They were selected by, uh, by the stakeholders. So in this case, as, as in the case of the other two uh, root cause analysis that we've done, the team members were uh, uh, selected, identified through the Mining Legislative Review Committee. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Mining Legislative Review Committee, this is a committee that's established under Section 21 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the, the Ontario Occupational Health and Safety Act. So essentially what Section 21 says is that it gives the Minister of Labour the authority to establish committees to provide health and safety advice to the Ministry of Labour, Trade and Skills Development. So the Mining Legislative Review Committee is the Section 21 Committee for the Ontario Mining Sector. Next slide, please. So this, uh, this table shows the, uh, the, the participants who took part in the 2018 uh, uh, mobile equipment root cause analysis. So the first four names shown above are the actual team members uh, on the risk assessment team. The remaining people in the uh, on the list here were observers. So you can see there was one from Laurentian University, one from Local 6500, and a number of people from the, uh, including myself from the uh, from the Ministry of Labor. Um, and then the uh, the uh, the session, the lead facilitator for the session was again Dr. Stu Joy Day. Um, so what's important to note here is that while the, uh, the observers were, uh, were entitled to take part in the session and to dis discuss uh, the process and, and to bring up ideas, actual decisions regarding what the causal factors would be and what the corresponding controls would, would be through this exercise were only made by the, the actual four team members. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a very busy diagram, um, but uh, so I'll take a few moments to go through this with you because I think it's, it's key to the uh, discussion here today. So the root cause analysis took four days to complete. The first day was, uh, was devoted to constructing what we refer to as a fishbone diagram, is what you see here in this slide. So the fishbone diagram is intended to capture all of those causal factors which which the team believes could contribute to the hypothetical unwanted event in question. So that unwanted event is shown in the red circle on the right-hand side of the diagram. As we said before, the statement was motor vehicle contacts workers. So in order to do this, uh, to, to do this root cause analysis, to identify uh, the, causal factors, the causal factors, there's many, many ways of doing it. But what we elected to do, again, based primarily on the advice of, of, of Dr. Sujoy Day, was to use what is known as a fishbone diagram. So what we used is a standard generic fishbone diagram template that has six categories. You can see are six key branches to it. 
And those are the tools and machines branch, the processes branch, the people's branch, uh, culture, environment, and measures. So all of the causal factors that we identified were done according to those six categories. Um, so, so the product from this exercise, uh, as I say, it took a full day to complete, um, were, were as follows. We ended up coming up with 59, uh, what we refer to as primary causal factors. And those are shown here on, on this diagram under the six, six different categories. There were 144 secondary uh, causal factors, and I'll discuss those in more detail once we get to the appendices. There were 50 tertiary causal factors, and, and there were also, uh, in, in some cases, three quaternary causal factors. Um, so this diagram here, it's important to note, only captures those 59 uh, primary causal factors. Furthermore, you can see that 10 of them are shown, have boxes around them. So these are deemed by, were deemed by the team out of the 59 to be the top 10 primary causal factors that could contribute to the uh, unwanted event in uh, question. So as I say, once we get to the appendices, uh, we'll describe in more detail um, what the, uh, what the uh, uh, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary causal factors uh, consisted of. It would be too busy to include all of that on one diagram. So therefore we elected to uh, to create a series of uh, six additional diagrams, which enable us to more fully describe what those, uh, what those additional causal factors look like. Next slide, please. Um, so from the fishbone diagram, as I stated a moment ago, you saw that there were 10 of the primary causal factors that, had, uh, that were in boxes, and these are the top 10 primary causal factors. So I'll just read through them. Existing procedures not based on a formal risk assessment process, acceptance to operate po uh, poorly maintained equipment, lack of mature risk assessment culture at the workplace, people tampering with safety devices such as bypass switches, insufficient line of sight. Uh, excuse me for a moment. Call in verification, one of the challenges of working from home. Um, insufficient line of sight, lack of noise, risk assessment didn't capture the unwanted risks, personnel not adhering to traffic management rules, personnel not reporting workplace conditions, and lack of traffic management policies and procedures. Next slide, please. So the next 10 slides show the controls that the team came up with for each of the top 10 primary causal factors. So what's important to emphasize at this point is that these are not just controls. In some cases, they are controls, but um, Often what we have here in these lists are activities or things that will actually support or enable a control. So a lot of the things that we have listed here are not controls in the, in the uh, conventional sense of a control or con con according to the conventional definition that we typically use in, uh, in risk assessment at the work. So I'll just, what I'm gonna do for the next 10 slides is just uh, walk you through uh, what, they, what the team came up with for controls for each of the top 10 causal factors. So in this case, um, uh, in this case, what we had here is for the causal factor existing procedures not based on a formal risk assessment process, the team came up with have a formal risk management framework for the development of operational procedures. Secondly, a uh, formal framework to review old or outdated procedures using risk management process in consultation with Joint Health and Safety Committee or worker health and safety representative. And then thirdly, convince leadership and workers for the need to get um, older procedures into the risk assess assessment fold. Um, so what's important to note here is that the, the team actually came up with co uh, uh, corresponding controls for all 59 um, uh, causal fa primary causal factors that were shown on the previous uh, slide. I think there were over 400 controls that the team came up with, but for the purposes of this session today, we're only going to take you through the um, or describe to you the the uh, the uh, controls that relate to the top 10 causal factors. Next slide, please. So these are the controls that the team came up with. Um, for the second the primary causal factor, acceptance to operate poorly maintained equipment. So what the team came up with in terms of controls listed here is build a factor of safety into all incentive programs, education awareness of risks of using substandard equipment uh, versus good equipment, 
Sharing and learning of past examples, incidents to account for it cannot happen to me attitude. Uh, the role of HSAs to bring le uh, lessons or lessons learned to the industry. Sharing maintenance requirements on tolerance on equipment standards. Having requirements for line management on job observations. Senior management should drive safety culture. Having all personnel understand cost implications on poorly operated uh, or maintained equipment and ensure um, uh, maintenance programs that exist in all workplaces. So I'd just like to bring your attention again to item D, the role of HSAs. What you'll see throughout, um, throughout the, the list that we have here of potential controls are reference to the HSAs. So what that tells us is that HSAs such as WSN have a key role to play moving forward in terms of, um, of mitigating uh, these kinds of risks. Next slide, please. Uh, so for the third uh, of the top 10 primary causal factors, lack of mature risk assessment culture in the workplace, we have uh, the list here of, of potential uh, associated controls. Educate and involve all workplace parties in the power and the fundamentals of risk assessment and management. Train people on risk management facilitation. Provide risk assessment guidelines. Better capability of HSAs to provide support on risk assessment. Make task risk assessment routine work uh, considering the hierarchy of controls. Proper lineup, uh, allowing for, that, for task, task hazards and controls to be identified. Work permit controlling traffic flow to minimize risk of motor vehicle contacting the worker. And senior leadership should action should drive safety culture through employee engagement and buy-in. So what's important to note here is that since 2017, um, the regulation for mines and mining plants under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the, that's Regulation 854, now have requirements since 2017 for uh, workplaces under that are covered under that regulation to have formal risk assessments in place. Next slide, please. And those are under sections 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3 of Regulation 854. The fourth uh, a, a primary causal factor of the top 10 is, is shown here, people tampering with safety devices. So the team came up with, uh, with the list of controls lists that are shown on this slide. Engineering out the ability to tamper, zero tolerance on such activities uh, by worker or supervisor, Tampered device should warrant investigation as to why there was a need to tamper. Proper training and lockout training as pertains to mobile equipment. ML enforcement, uh, add ticketing to tampering of safety devices. Safety devices should be included in equipment maintenance schedule, post-op of the equipment and formal reporting uh, system that identifies defective safety devices. Next slide, please. Insufficient line of sight. This is this was a causal factor that uh, uh, took up a lot of uh, time and and, uh, and uh, prompted a lot of conversation amongst the uh, amongst the team members. So as you can see, uh, a fairly comprehensive list of corresponding controls is listed here. Um, consider line of, of sight in mine design, road design, building design. So address this issue right at the design stage. Consider optimal line of sight during procurement of equipment. Encourage OEMs to uh, interactively consider line of sight and their products. Integrate proximity detection technology. Uh, management of change process for adding anything to equipment that could impact on line of sight. Risk assessment of operating environment slash changes to the operating environment. A review line of sight evaluation on equipment, ensuring it is incorporated in operator training. Maintenance personnel should be cognizant of line of sight issues. Line of sight education training for everybody, not just the operator. HSAs to be more proactive for line of sight issues. Increase the visibility of smaller vehicles through the use of light shining on the back. Use of personal strobes. Restricting access to work area and signage to be up, up uh, to be standardized and uh, durable. So I think one thing that's noteworthy here is that um, uh, the Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development through the Mining Legislative Review Committee is now um, uh, actually uh, uh, pursuing and have a proposed amendment in place for a, uh, for a management of change uh, section under, the, under, the, under Regulation 854 as, as per uh, item E that's in this list of, of controls. 
Um, what's also, I think, noteworthy here, and you'll see it show up again um, in, in some of the other lists that we're going to go through, is that there is a role here for equipment manufacturers to play in, uh, in helping to mitigate uh, uh, such risks. Next slide, please. Lack of noise, uh, and again, this could be an issue with uh, electric or battery equipment that tends to be quieter than the, the uh, traditional diesel equipment that we have in our minds. So the list that the team came up with uh, shown here, traffic management programs should take into consideration hazards associated with equipment that do not generate a lot of noise. Risk assessment should include hazards associated with equipment that do not generate a lot of noise. Consider engineering strobe lights on such uh, vehicles or equipment, proximity detect detection devices in specific areas, and again, encourage OEMs to work with each other to factor in hazards associated with equipment that do not generate a lot of noise. Next slide, please. Moving on to number seven um, of, of, the, of the top 10 list. Uh, so number seven was that, as you recall, risk assessment did not capture the unwanted risks. So again, quite a comprehensive list of corresponding controls here. I'll just quickly run through them. Real life validation of residual risk and controls by the end user, training in risk assessment and hazard identification, ensure the right people are involved in the process, training and risk facilitation, report near miss data to incorporate into the risk assessment analysis, tangible results on operations based on risk assessment, better analytics to feed into risk assessment, um, better data and analytics to reduce, to reduce subjectivity, better, H, better capability of HSAs to provide support on risk assessment, maintain an active risk register, integrate risk assessment analysis into a functional system where people can access information and act accordingly, and MOC process includes updating the risk register. So you may uh, observe that there are are maybe some overlap with the controls that are listed on this slide uh, compared with um, th those listed on uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the slide for causal factor number three, both having to do with, with risk. Um, so, and you may also notice that some controls show up in a number of different places. And so I guess by conventional uh, systems design definition, those would constitute uh, critical controls. Uh, and as I said before, um, there's now a requirement under, under uh, the mining regulation, according to sections 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, to have a, a risk register as part of a, uh, the uh, workplace risk assessment. Next slide, please. Moving on to number eight, in terms of the uh, top 10 primary causal factors. Number eight reads, personnel not adhering to traffic management rules. So the list the team came up with for corresponding controls, First of all, develop a risk-based traffic management plan, communication monitoring of the traffic management plan personnel, awareness on the requirements of the traffic management plan and how it specifically impacts the worker, monitor and ensure compliance with the traffic management plan, understand protocols when working close to rail lines, prior, proper orientation of external personnel, such as contractors with respect to the traffic management plan, and workplaces enforce non-compliance of to traffic management rules. So what's important to note also, since 2017, uh, Regulation 854, the, uh, the regulation for mines and mine, mining plants now has a requirement for mines to have formal traffic management programs. This is under section 105.1 of that regulation. Next slide. Moving on to number nine of the top 10, personnel not reporting workplace conditions. That's the causal factor. The controls listed here are functioning IRS that encourages reporting, proper training and hazard near misidentification, develop a stop and correct program, create a culture to stop and correct or report unsafe conditions as part of the stop and correct program. Opportunity for the HSAs, again, to show examples of an empowered workplace, Ensure a simple process for reporting is in place and then build a factor of safety into all incentive programs. The last, uh, next slide please, the last one of the, uh, of the top 10. And this one, as you may recall from the fishbone diagram was lack of traffic management policies and procedures. So again, a short list of, of uh, 
or a shorter list of controls listed here, have a formal risk management framework for the development of traffic management policies and procedures, get the HSAs to provide training to help industry develop traffic management policies and procedures, and understand the expectations of a traffic management program, such as a guideline. Um, next slide, please. So the next six slides um, uh, show uh, expanded diagrams for each of those six um, branches of the uh, of the fishbone diagram that you saw back on slide number 12. Uh, so I'm just gonna quickly walk you through these. Um, so this particular diagram, this particular fishbone diagram uh, is the expanded diagram for the tools and machines category um, uh, of, the, of the primary uh, fishbone diagram that you saw earlier. So it's color coded, as you can see, there's a legend at the bottom of the screen. You may not be able to see it entirely. I think a little bit of this is cut off. But essentially what you have here are the, are the uh, what it shows are the 10 primary causal factors as per what you saw on slide 12. Then in addition to that, in red, you have 25 secondary causal factors. In blue, and the blue is hard to see in this slide, you have second tertiary causal factors. Uh, and again, as I stated earlier, the reason why we have these drawings in an appendix is it, it would be too uh, complex and too busy to have all of this information on, on one diagram. Next slide. This is the uh, expanded diagram for the, pro the processes component of the larger fishbone diagram. Again, it's color coded. Um, you have uh, 13 primary causal factors shown in black. And again, you can see three of those are in boxes and those were uh, three of the top 10 primary causal factors. You also have in red, 27 uh, secondary causal factors and in blue, there were 11 tertiary ones. Next slide. Appendix three, this is for the people. This is the expanded diagram for the people component of the fishbone diagram. Uh, again, nine primary uh, causal factors. And again, three of these in boxes. So those were three of the top 10. You had 23 secondary causal factors, which are shown in red, uh, 10 tertiary ones in blue. And in this case, you had two uh, quaternary uh, causal factors shown in green. So, you know, the, the essence of the, of, the, uh, of, of the root cause analysis work when you're preparing a, um, a fishbone diagram, as Dr. Sujoy Day often uh, advises us, is that the, the essence or the, the value in doing this is to keep drilling down. So, I mean, the extent to which you drill down to identify secondary, tertiary, quaternary, in some cases, causal factors is only limited by the amount of time that you have, right? So at some point you have to cut it off, but, you know, in, in, in other types of, in other experiences, you know, um, you may have, uh, it's, it's not uncommon to, uh, to drill down even deeper than what we've done here. But that's the value in, 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 in pursuing this type of, uh, of root cause analysis. Next slide, please. So appendix uh, uh, five, or sorry, four speaks to the, uh, to the culture component of the, uh, of the fishbone diagram, the culture branch or arm. And so this is the expanded diagram for, for that aspect of it. 10 uh, primary causal factors, two of them in boxes, 23 um, secondary ones shown in red, uh, nine tertiary ones shown in blue and one quaternary one. Next slide, appendix five, this is the environment diagram. 11 primary uh, uh, causal factors, two in the top 10, 32 tertiary ones um, and 12, uh, uh, sorry, 32 secondary ones, 12 tertiary ones and no quaternary ones. And finally, the last one, appendix six, this is the measures uh, component, the, the expanded drive for, for that component of the fishbone diagram. Only six primary causal factors, 15, uh, 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 oh, yeah, only six primary causal factors, uh, 15 secondary ones and uh, uh, four uh, tertiary ones. And the final slide that I'll be going through. Next slide, please. So this was a list that was compiled by Dr. Day. And what it's intended, I'm not gonna go through it all, but what it, it intends is, it's intended to emphasize is that there are many different uh, tools and ways 
of, uh, of pursuing um, you know, risk assessment work and in particular root cause analysis work. So some of these, uh, some, this is a comprehensive list showing some of those tools that are available. And um, I just want to uh, bring your attention momentarily to item number 19 up at the top right hand corner. So the fishbone um, uh, analysis, which we've been discussing over the last 25 minutes or so, is also known as the Ishakoa type of analysis. You may have heard that term used uh, previously. So at this point, I'll turn it back to Philip Derish uh, for the remainder of the, uh, of the presentation. All right, on your screen, you see the uh, contact information of a uh, um, person from the Ministry of Labor that you could contact with regards to uh, information uh, with regards to the root cause analysis or any uh, information with regards to risk assessment. Uh, but before I continue doing that, I would like to bring your attention to the result of the beginning poll. Uh, the first question, provide best practice for formal risk assessment is 78%. Uh, provide best practice for traffic management is another 78%. Use for uh, hands-on adult learning principles in training, 30%. W an audit of on-site training process for risk assessment is 26%. And then develop resource documents in consultation with supplier or equipment manufacturer is 57%. So we got the first two questions as uh, 78 and then followed by the uh, last question as the, uh, the third uh, uh, rank. So um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this information, what you see on your screen are the uh, contact uh, uh, information for Dr. Sujir Day, um, the uh, Corporate Risk Officer man uh, or Manager of Enterprise uh, Risk Management of the Ministry. Uh, you got Robert Barkley, um, he's the Senior Manager of Provincial Health and Safety. And then you have Glenn Staskos, who is the Provincial Specialist Mining Health and Safety as well. Next slide, please. So uh, when we look at performance-wise, we normally use the, uh, the um, uh, statistics as a barometer. So what you see on your screen is actually Ontario mining steel and other smelting sector traumatic fatal for the period 2012 to 2016. And uh, now during that period, there were 14 traumatic fatalities, um, uh, fatal injuries in Ontario mining steel and, and other smelting sectors for the top seven category, categories, including uh, mobile equipment. And three of those are actually associated with mobile equipment uh, incidents. In 2013 is actually um, a, a, a worker in contact with uh, uh, mobile equipment. And in 2015, both of those is, um, uh, again, is a worker involved in a ground, um, underground rail haulage incident with fatal injured worker. Uh, and then the uh, 2015 is another worker in contact with equipment. So those are the uh, the uh, the uh, information that led to why is it so important to look at mobile equipment as uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, top ranking as far as, uh, as hazards in the workplace is concerned, especially underground mines. Next slide, please. So uh, this brings me to why is it so important to do risk assessment and not just ranking the risk, but look at the priority risk and do some, some kind of root cause analysis. Um, more often than not, when we do root cause analysis, we normally do it when there is a critical injury or a fatal injury that happens in the workplace. Uh, and then we, in the root cause analysis, we dig deeper to be able to get controls in order for that injury or incident not to happen again. But it should be uh, a process of a proactive exercise. So you look at your uh, your uh, risk ranking, you look at the priority uh, um, hazards, and then you do a root cause analysis on those priority hazards to dig deeper the way uh, it's almost similar to what we did with the uh, the uh, root cause analysis conducted on mobile equipment in contact with, with workers. And you can do the same thing on, on uh, um, as per operations concern and without 
uh, waiting for an incident to happen before you do it. So it's, um, uh, we are advocating a proactive uh, uh, process to make sure that you dig deeper to, uh, to provide or develop or determine controls uh, in order for that incident not to happen and hurt uh, people. Next slide, please. So uh, back in, in um, 2014, they conducted um, a risk assessment, as mentioned by uh, Bob uh, uh, earlier, um, a risk assessment in underground mining, uh, looking at health and safety. And um, there were about more than 260 hazards that were identified. And what it did was look at those hazards and okay, uh, how many are mobile equipment? And out of those hazards, there were actually uh, 23 mobile equipment hazards and risks that were identified out of those 263. And so what we did, we uh, took the top 10 uh, mobile equipment health and safety hazards and they are shown on your screen. I'm not going to, to uh, go too much detail on them, but just to bring highlights, uh, the uh, hazards that, and risks that can happen in workplace could be a large vehicle in contact with, uh, with pedestrian or a small vehicle in contact with a large vehicle. Um, the other uh, uh, hazards could be um, driving scoop in an open stope or fall, falling into stopes. Uh, there are hazards, it's uh, wheels and rims, um, tiger hoist inspections, which means um, before you do something else with regards to repair and maintenance, you have to check uh, uh, those, those uh, um, equipment that you do use for, uh, for uh, uh, your work. Um, the other one is lack of proper maintenance of brakes, uh, braking systems, uh, as well as fire suppression system. And as, uh, as mentioned by uh, Bob earlier, lack of traffic control systems, or there may be, but then again, it's not properly implemented. The other one is certainly in, in underground mines, we always have poor road conditions. And then the uh, last one is the uh, fall protection and maintenance. Uh, this is especially, um, for uh, non-entry stops where in you establish remote control program and you have to make sure that you have to maintain this program. You have to make sure that uh, you follow the protocol that has been developed as far as those concerned. Next slide, please. In 2016, they did similar risk assessment for surface uh, mining. Um, and out of the uh, the uh, 141 events or uh, hazard risks that were identified uh, for uh, 25 categories, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and one of them is mobile equipment. 16 of those are related to mobile equipment. Right? And what you see on your screen are top 10 um, that were identified. First one is distracted driving, certainly. The other one is lack of tire safety, which is similar to uh, uh, underground. Injury due to holist vehicles uh, could be related to uh, uh, personal in contact with uh, uh, mobile equipment, poor visibility, and certainly um, larger equipment would have uh, a lot of blind spots. The other one is vehicle rollovers um, or basically going over embankments. Lack of traffic control system, similar to uh, underground non holist uh, uh, vehicle incidents. Um, lack of procedure to deal with hydraulic energy on equipment. Uh, struck by uh, um, vehicle incidents. And the other one is vehicle rollover. In, in, in uh, surface mines, you're looking at ramps. The vehicle rollover on the tent would uh, be associated to uh, vehicles overloaded or going up and down, stick ramp, and that could. Uh, um, uh, cause the uh, equipment to roll over. And next uh, next item, please. And out of this uh, list, 60% of those are similar to what were identified uh, during the uh, risk assessment in, in underground mines uh, as far as mobile equipment is concerned. Next slide, please. So this brings us to what are the top, uh, top 10 root causes of motor vehicle worker contact in, in, in mining operations. And this one is following the um, information that was provided by uh, Bob Barkley with regards to the uh, root cause analysis, which is basically looking at uh, uh, pedestrian in contact with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, 
mod motor vehicle or uh, equipment. So there are 10 categories that you see in there. And uh, root causes could be existing procedures not based on formal risk-based uh, uh, assessment. Number two is uh, acceptance to operate poorly maintained uh, uh, equipment, which means that um, although we have plans to put uh, equipment periodically in maintenance, but they are not being followed. So uh, what would workers would do is just use this equipment until something goes wrong and they bring it up for uh, maintenance. Uh, the third is lack of uh, mature risk management uh, culture, which is uh, again related to IRS. Um, is there a buy-in of doing uh, an honest goodness field level risk assessment? Uh, four is uh, people tampering with safety uh, devices. So uh, there are cases where um, I just want, I just need this equipment. Um, there's um, a safety device in it uh, in order for it to make run, just tamper it, just in order for you to use it, which is not uh, uh, a good way of doing it. The other one is insufficient line of sight. So uh, technology-wise, in services underground, we normally go bigger for bigger production. So using this, this larger equipment, you have issues with line of sight, line spots, and everything like that. The other one is lack of noise. Um, we're going towards using uh, electric uh, uh, vehicles or uh, uh, battery operated vehicles or equipment underground and these are actually very very quiet that lack of noise normally you don't know this if you're working around those areas and you didn't see that there's something behind you because it's so quiet the um number seven is risk assessment did not capture unwanted uh, um risk this basically uh, goes back to uh um, item number three, wherein you need to have uh, an awareness training in order for uh, proper risk assessment processes being done in the workplace. Uh, eight is the personnel not following traffic management rules. There's a reason why uh, section 105.1 is, is there and uh, um, it is for the uh, operations to comply with. It's not just complying with developing a program yet, but when you develop program as an operation, you have to make sure that you uh, comply with your own program. So that basically, it has to be based on evidence that, hey, we're doing this, uh, we're strictly um, following maintenance or uh, traffic procedures, uh, wherever location in, in, in uh, the workplace, wherein there are interaction, possible interaction of mobile equipment with pedestrian, possible interaction with mobile equipment to mobile equipment. And then uh, number nine talks about communication. It's always good to um, provide any information that is very unusual to uh, at a workplace. Right? So uh, uh, may not happen uh, at the time, but then again, if there are unusual things that you see in your workplace, it would be uh, good to follow proper communication system. What are the things that you have to report and everything like that? If there is a concern, somebody will will. Uh, 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 be responsible to make sure that the concerns are not there. And then certainly the last one is lack of travel management policies and procedures. This goes back to uh, eight as well. So although we have developed things with regards to uh, uh, the uh, program, but then again, you're not implementing it or there is lack of uh, like the elements of it and everything all that. Next slide, please. So just going through uh, what are the control mechanisms that you need to develop as far as uh, mobile equipment is concerned. So one, as mentioned by Bob Berkeley earlier, is developing a, tra a traffic management program as required under uh, uh, section 105.1 of regulation 854. All right. So uh, the program should include measures, procedures to prevent motor vehicle collision, by addressing hazards to reduce visibility of motor vehicles. And uh, what is important when the program is done, uh, it's not just like sitting on a shelf, it has to be reviewed at least annually as per regulation. And uh, the next one is uh, most of the time we have programs to make sure that equipment 
are running properly and we put them on the maintenance program. When you develop something like this, you have to ensure that you have to follow that program. If it says that, or a manufacturer's uh, specification says that you need to do maintenance program on your equipment on a monthly basis, it has to be done. If it was not specified by manufacturer's uh, specification, then you go back to uh, the regulation how often you do the, uh, the, uh, the maintenance, right? So next slide, please. And certainly complying with section 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3 of regulation 854 is to make sure that uh, you have identified all the hazards that relates to mobile equipment, not just uh, on travel. You also look at uh, mobile equipment at the repair shop and everything all that. Uh, and you do a risk rating. Uh, and then uh, the top priority hazard that you develop controls or you put them into root cause analysis to dig a little bit deeper on, on those uh, priority hazards to make sure that you come up with a better control to make sure that there is no unwanted event that will happen as far as that uh, incident is concerned. And the other one is overview hazards uh, with regards to uh, locations in, in my side. Uh, what are the... Um, the uh, the hazards that are associated with drum travel, uh, operating equipment around open holes. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, lighting is always one of the issues that we deal with in, in, in the workplace underground. And uh, when you're done uh, with your vehicle or your equipment, where do you park them? Uh, how do you park them? Uh, what are the procedures you have to follow as far as parking concerned? And certainly, when you put uh, an equipment for maintenance, access to shops and maintenance uh, and equipment maintenance, uh, is concerned. And then certainly the last one is pedestrian visibility. It's not just like, uh, although there's a lot of technology now that you would uh, uh, know uh, beforehand that uh, a person is around the area, but we'll, we'll talk about those ones uh, at the, uh, uh, later on. Next slide, please. Certainly, uh, some of the controls that we have to develop is as, as I mentioned earlier, this location. Uh, traffic control as far as traveling in ramps is concerned has to be developed. Factors to consider for mobile equipment travel on uh, ramps, uh, equipment right of way, right? pedestrians. Uh, if you're using a uh, tracking system, what are, uh, is it operating properly? Uh, in cases where in uh, what are the procedures that has to be taken when there's radio uh, failure or power failure, uh, and certainly what are the things that you would do when you're encountering smoke or say stance gas. Uh, and what are the, uh, the uh, procedures that has to be followed when there's a breakdown uh, on ramp with, especially when you're using large uh, equipment and everything else. And certainly um, in, in ramps going on surface during winter months, fog is one of the issues that we, we normally deal with. The other one is uh, operating mobile equipment around open holes. There are several incidents that happened wherein um, heavy equipment just dive into uh, the soap. And these are the factors that has to be uh, looked into and uh, things to consider for operating mobile equipment around these, uh, these open holes. Uh, dumping of the edge of an open hole, what is the procedure as far as so is there a, a, a bumper or uh, is there a stopper or if there's none, what are the procedures that you have to uh, uh, undertake so that the, the, your vehicle will not go uh, over the, uh, the open slope. Uh, when you are using bumper designs, uh, bumpers, what are the design of the bumper? Is it uh, high enough that it will actually uh, hold an equipment if it accidentally uh, goes over the bumper? And the other one is uh, barricades and warning signs. If and when open holes are in there, uh, when you put barricades, it has the, the, the proper size should be uh, uh, put in there. And we all know that uh, um, if it's not too visible, some, somebody can just run over it. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, lighting, as I mentioned earlier, is very, very important. Um, anywhere uh, where we, we are, where people would converse uh, and everything, uh, lighting is always uh, important in shops and everything like that, where you have several equipment, uh, big and small, uh, within the area and lighting is always very important. What are the factors to uh, consider? Uh, what are the ambient, uh, the ambient lighting around uh, underground and uh, uh, surface infrastructures uh, at underground entrances? 
in areas adjacent to workplace where workers are required to uh, to travel or people are required to converse or chit chat with supervisor or whatnot. Uh, in any circumstances where the uh, nature of the equipment or the operation may create a hazard to worker due to insufficient lighting, it has to be uh, considered to develop uh, a lighting system. Parking is uh, very, very important. Factors to consider, uh, how orderly do you park your equipment in designated parking space? Uh, are the, uh, the uh, uh, vehicle parked with warning lights if you are actually in a work uh, area? Uh, is proper choking used uh, before you start your uh, your day using an equipment? Do you do the circle check uh, before you uh, start your vehicle? What are the uh, uh, start up procedures that you have to do? And certainly, very important thing, you don't want to be stuck somewhere else with no fuel. You look at the uh, 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 fuel content of your vehicle before you, you start running uh, or using it. Next slide, please. Uh, when we put equipment into maintenance, we bring them to shops and access to shops and equipment maintenance is very, very important as well as uh, as far as developing control activities concerned. What are the factors to consider? Clearance on the entry to the, uh, the, uh, the shop. Uh, we know that there are workers in the shop as well and you're bringing in a big equipment. Safety of workers inside the shop is, is important as well. Uh, if there's a need for a person to do signaling to make sure that uh, um, no one will get hurt, especially when you're bringing bigger equipment is, is required. Uh, remove mechanics from uh, vulnerable positions during position of vehicles. So uh, those are important to consider. Procedures for working on tires and assemblies. As you know that uh, uh, earlier, one of the top hazards is uh, um, uh, wheels and rims. And then certainly proper choking when they are uh, in the shop. Next slide, please. Certainly, technology is very, very important in our workplace. And if there is a change in technology, we need to change our uh, programs to be consistent or procedures to be consistent with the technology. Or if there's a change on process, we have to make sure that we have to change our procedures, uh, policies, so that it will be consistent with that new technology that we bring in. Now, the, uh, the implementation of collision management systems is very important, especially when we bring in larger equipment in, in our workplace. Uh, are these larger equipment equipped with uh, uh, 360 uh, degrees uh, cameras just to make sure that they see uh, around the equipment or not? Uh, what are the systems that we do use to make sure that we're tracking people or uh, as a worker, you would know that there's an equipment around you without even seeing that the equipment is there. Uh, proximity detection, this would be uh, appropriate for big, big equipment wherein they're working around areas where there are people to make sure that it's not only protecting the, uh, the equipment from buying the walls of, of the, uh, the headings, but making sure that it, you protect workers that are working around large equipment as well. Uh, levels of intervention is very uh, important. Uh, when workers are, are service workers are working around the area where there are big equipment, use of warning lights like strobe lights is very important, like surveyors, geologists, uh, ground control, not going to operations enough to make sure that you have to sh uh, to to uh, uh, ensure that uh, uh, equipment operators are aware that you are there. Like using strobe lights is very important. Uh, and then certainly, what are the things that we have to consider when we're using battery oper or electrical operated equipment? As I mentioned earlier, it's so quiet uh, and, and uh, you won't even notice it's just behind you when you're working in an area, especially when everything is, is, is noisy. So those are the things that we have to consider as far as the, this, uh, those are concerned. So uh, uh, next slide, please. Certainly training, if you develop a program, you develop a new procedure, you change the procedure, it has to be communicated, right? Awareness training is very important. No single measure is unimportant in reducing number of incidents in the workplace and the likelihood of this incident to happen is training and making sure that workers are aware with regards to these policies and procedures, right? Uh, training should focus on, especially concerning uh, uh, motor vehicle, visibility line of sight information, uh, specific visibility and travel risk that can be encountered when you're working underground, 
uh, pedestrians should be trained to use their eyes, ears, uh, safety wells, signal lamps, and everything like to make sure that uh, they would uh, uh, make sure that they're uh, seen by the uh, the operators. Operators train emergency warning devices and procedures in the event of uh, mechanical failure, uh, wherever they are in the workplace. Uh, a training of both workers and operators um, is very important with what are the warning systems that we are basically using as far as uh, uh, the workplace is concerned. Say, if I mentioned earlier about uh, service crew, geology, uh, mechanics, ground control, surveyor, and everything we are going to an area where it's busy, then certainly you have to make sure that uh, hey, I'm here um, by using technology like strobe lights and everything. Next slide, please. So without further ado, I would like to uh, um, uh, give uh, this presentation to uh, uh, Sam. Sam is the health and safety representative uh, of WSN covering the Timmins area. All right, thanks, uh, Philip. Uh, so uh, we are over time, um, so I'm not going to go into uh, great detail with uh, information and resources uh, there. Um, there's a number of slides. This presentation is going to be uh, communicated uh, to yourselves. And there's, um, again, a number of resources from Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development, and Workplace uh, Safety North uh, from their websites. Um, so uh, we're going to go directly to uh, Q&A. Okay, so um, we don't want to uh, lose anyone. There's a number of questions there, and I'll move it over to uh, Paige. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so uh, apologies that we are over time. However, we will stay on for a few minutes to answer some questions. Uh, if anyone does need to leave the webinar, this webinar is recorded, so you will receive uh, this webinar within one business day. So uh, we do have some questions from the audience here. Uh, so the first one we will uh, address is, uh, so very interesting, uh, the conventional controls were not the only ones used. Great to see culture mentioned here. How do you convince the industry to talk about these topics? So Philip or Bob, if you'd like to take that. Um, it's, it's Bob. Um, how do you, so I guess the question was, how do you convince the, uh, the industry to, uh, to talk about culture? Is that, was that the question or the impact of culture? When, um, so, uh, probably lots of ways to consider that. One of the things that comes to mind, and again, um, I'll, I'll I'll, if I'll uh, refer back to some of, one of the services that's provided to uh, by WSN. WSN has a uh, a tool available known as the CAT. The C A A the C A A T is the acronym. That's the Climate Assessment Audit Tool. And uh, again, people at WSN know far more about it than I do. But um, what I know about it is that it's a very useful uh, means and process to evaluate. Uh, the health and safety culture, um, you know, looking at it from an IRS, internal responsibility perspective, um, at, and at, again, available through WSN to try and understand, um, you know, whether, whether the culture uh, that's in place at a specific workplace is, uh, is serving in the best interest of uh, promoting health and safety at that workplace. So that's one idea that comes to mind. Uh, I'm not sure if Philip has any other uh, ideas. But certainly, I, I fully agree. Culture is, is a very is a very important consideration in, um, in not just with with respect to mobile equipment, but with regard to any um, health and safety considerations. Right? You need the right culture in place to uh, to fully enable health and safety. Certainly, and that's right, uh, Bob. Uh, there should be a buy-in from the frontline worker all the way to uh, uh, the top honcho of an operation to make. Uh, the culture work within an operation. It's not just like uh, the, wor the workers at the front end are, are trying to promote uh, a good culture and making sure that the uh, incident will not happen or an unwanted event will not happen in the workplace. If there is no buy-in from certainly from the, uh, the top management, then uh, there is what we call dysfunctional IRS. 
so to speak, and that would uh, what the uh, cut um, uh, assessment or audit can determine if you have that uh, that uh, uh, services provided by WSM. One of the one of the other things that comes to mind is that um, you know if you look at the at the uh, at the uh, conventional hierarchy of controls that um, th that you know people uh, refer to from a health for health and safety purposes at a workplace. I mean, I've lot, heard a lot of people say that one of the things that could be uh, inserted in that hierarchy is workplace culture, right? Or another way of looking at it is you need the right kind of culture to ensure that those controls uh, in the hierarchy are, are enabled, right? So a number of ways of, of looking at, but certainly culture is, uh, is top of mind when we're looking at health and safety. Yeah, that's the uh, the uh, the uh, why the uh, the app is was developed. It is basically based on IRM. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so next question we have here. So amazing use of the fishbone analysis ability to drill down deep is essential. Uh, very simple to understand. How will you prioritize these controls? Um. So um, again, we haven't, um, or I haven't done a lot of work since 2018 when, when, we, uh, when we made these results available, but a, a number of things uh, come to mind. Um, and and um, we started to do some work in this area, but it hasn't uh, been taken to completion. But, you know, as I say, there were, I think I mentioned in the presentation, there were, if you look at the combined number of controls, if you consider the, uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary, and quaternary controls. I think there were over 400 controls. And there's a separate document, I'm not sure if it's going to be made available, that lists all of the controls that we come up with, that we came up with. But one, one, um, one thought that occurs to me is there may be an opportunity to, uh, first of all, categorize those controls according to the hierarchy of controls. So in other words, um, duplicate, you know, find out which ones belong into the, uh, you know, the substitution or elimination category, moving right down to the engineering controls and through the, through the hierarchy, right? So if that work were done, it would give you a sense of, of where those 400 controls, how they're grouped with respect to the hierarchy of controls. The other thing, as I said, um, uh, I think in the presentation is some of those controls show up in one or more than one category or one of the six categories in the fishbone, right? So, um, you know, if you consider some of the conventional thinking on risk assessment, by definition, if those, if those controls that affect more than one category um, exist, then they could be deemed critical controls, right? So that's another way of, 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 of uh, trying to understand what the priority should be. Again, that, ha that work has not been done yet, but uh, I think those are opportunities to, uh, to better make use of the findings from, uh, from this analysis. Thank you. Uh, so we do have one more question. Uh, so was there any discussion of adverse events that could occur from the interventions or control measures? And is it ever included in root cause analysis? Um, so in, in this case, we had not. So, so in other words, um, to me, that would, if I understand the question correctly, that would amount to almost like a management of change issue, right? So if I understand the question, I think it's about saying, well, you know, um, we're introducing this one control to, mi to mitigate the risk uh, associated with a known unwanted event or, uh, but then is, is there a problem with that control, right? Like, is there is, uh, is that control, that new control that we're introducing, is that going to cause problems? So, so we have not done that in this case, but I mean, certainly a, a great question. And I think one of the, uh, one of the, the topical uh, uh, examples of that currently is, uh, you know, with battery electric vehicles, right? So, you know, we have bat we've introduced battery electric vehicles ostensibly to solve one health and safety problem, um, you know, i.e., uh, diesel emissions, right? Uh, which is certainly a high risk uh, occupational health and safety hazard. But then again, there are issues associated with battery electric vehicles that we need to better under, more fully understand as well, right? So I, I'm not sure if, that, if that's uh, an example of what the question was about, but that's what comes to mind. 
Thank you. Uh, so that's all the time we have today for questions. So I want to thank you for attending the webinar regarding worker contact with motor vehicles in mining operations. A copy of the presentation and the recording will be emailed to participants after the webinar and posted on the resources page of WorkplaceSafetyNorth.ca. Thanks again and have a safe day.